abbreviated online version of the ESIG Tucson Spring Technical Workshop. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As you know, we canceled the physical meeting in Tucson due to the coronavirus situation, and we decided to proceed with a shortened online version. We started the series of 12 webinars in mid-March. This is now the 11th of the 12th, and the last one will be the week after next on May 5th. You can find the full schedule and links to the past events at the ESIG website under the events tab. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with a few hundred people on the line, we will have individual presentations of 15 minutes, followed by a few minutes of discussion moderated by the session chair, with possibly some time for discussion at the end. The lines will be muted, so we ask you to use the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Today we'll be hosting session 10 on challenges with high inverter-based resource penetration, chaired by Julia Matoivasan. Julia is a lead planning engineer at ERCOT. She's a longtime participant in ESIG and a great contributor. She's an active member of the Reliability Working Group and the co-chair of the High Share of Inverter-Based Generation Task Force. She's very active in both national and international professional activities. I've known Julia for many years now through her involvement with ESIG, and I consider her a good friend. Julia, we appreciate having you here, and I'll now turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for your kind introductions, as always. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to, and honored to chair this timely and relevant session. Uh, there are places around the world, such as South Australia, Texas, Ireland, Hawaii, and Great Britain, that are already experiencing penetration of inverter-based resources, about 50% of instantaneous system load. Additionally, uh, more and more, in, there are pockets of the interconnected systems that uh, where share of inverter-based resources may be as high as 100% or even more. With the current state of affairs, uh, I don't think challenges associated with high penetration of inverter-based resources need any lengthy introduction. Um, and today we have six excellent speakers to talk in depth about challenges and possible solutions. I encourage you all to hang there for full two hours uh, of this session um, and listen to all speakers and post your questions. With that, and in the interest of time, I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Deepak Ramasubramanian, uh, who will be talking about uh, grid forming converter future without frequency droop control. Deepak is a senior engineer scientist at the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. He joined EPRI in 2017, uh, where his work is in the area of modeling, control, and stability analysis of the bulk power system, with recent focus on impacts of large-scale integration of converter interface generation and distributed energy resources. Deepak, take it away. Thank you very much, Julia, uh, for the introduction. And uh, what I'll be talking about today is uh, we've been doing some work on uh, reimagining what is frequency control in an all-inverter system. Now, uh, w whether it ends up being grid forming or not is still an open question because uh, there's no industry-wide definition of what is grid forming, but uh, just by the properties that it exhibits, uh, it, it seems to be in some form or the other grid forming. And what motivated us to go down this route is that uh, in a conventional system, you have frequency which is very much governed by the electromagnetic properties of the network. So what happens is that the, the machine and the network, because of uh, laws of electromagnetism, they lock their behavior and they're in sync with each other. So change in load is automatically or naturally reflected uh, in the speed of rotation of the machine. Now, as you see on the diagram below, uh, what essentially happens is that when you have the change in the rotational speed of motors, which are a uh, majority of the load, uh, inherently, it influences both electrical frequency and mechanical frequency uh, on, the, on the generation side. And then your system frequency is governed by the speed of these rotating machines, uh, hence the term governor that we, that we all know. And just to give a recap from uh, what this actually reflects as or how it is represented, there's this classic 
uh, block diagram representation, which is in Prabhakundu's book, uh, chapter 11, actually. Uh, and this plot is adapted from that. So we, if you look at the response, which contrasts against a steam turbine, which has reheat feature, or a steam turbine, which does not have reheat feature, and a hydro turbine, uh, when you have a single machine isolated scenario, and if you put a 10% load increase uh, on these types of machines with typical parameters as from the book, then you by default seem to get a large rokoff. You get 0.5 hertz per second or one hertz per second. By default, you get a large rokoff in this isolated scenario. But what's more interesting is that you have this varied time constant behavior when compared to a hydro machine to a steam machine and with and without reheat. Now, of course, you can get faster control when you have it in isochronous mode instead of just a normal regular group control mode, but that results in increased torsional stress or you can have lamp rate considerations. And because speed is being a quantity which is controlled and you don't have a speed of any generator being exactly the same value at all points in time, uh, you can have infighting with the variety of controls that you have. Now, the reason for bringing this figure up back to the forefront is that it allows us to recognize that even with machines, uh, you can have a possibility of having that kind of a classic L kind of a shape of response as shown by the orange curve here. But we also have machines which do have a significant lag time in responding uh, to the events that you have on a system. So if you have a system with every, every generator being a hydro turbine, uh, we could see the same kinds of impacts, which means that uh, by default with that large row cost that you have, uh, with some machines being able to take it, we could make use of that or make use of that understanding and concept to help design some of our frequency control principles for the future. Now, when you, when you translate that to an all converter system, immediately one has to realize is that there is this break in the electromagnetic link between what you would have as the source and the network, and instead now that lock has to be obtained using a controller. Uh, and there's no physical link between generation load balance and frequency. Of course, if one puts a load event, one would see the frequency dropping or the rate of change of angle uh, changing in a manner which one might assume that it is like frequency as we know it from a conventional system, but there's actually no physical link from an electromagnetic properties and converters can operate at any frequency. So even if, even if this structure remains, what got us thinking is that can we use these natural electrical properties that are there in the network with respect to the fact that you still have electrical frequency changing, you still have rate of change of angle that occurs when you have a change in load, and because converters are a faster resource, because they have uh, lower mechanical time constants, of course, assuming and recognizing that wind turbines will have a mechanical time constant, but it will be smaller as compared to a large thermal plant. And of course, uh, solar PV and battery energy storage would not really have uh, large time constants. So if we have that, can we go towards an ideal L-shaped response where the frequency upon occurrence of an event, if all the inverter-based resources are reacting, uh, it, the frequency will settle at, at a value which is good for the system uh, almost instantaneously. Now, this brings up actually a philosophical question first that uh, firstly on the left-hand side, would we still need frequency control in such a system? Would we still have to have a kind of a resource which is monitoring and maintaining frequency at the value at which we have grown to, to be accustomed to, uh, even though you lose that direct link. And there are many needs and many uh, reasons to have frequency control, predominantly even if we exclude motor drives or clocks or geomagnetic clocks and things like that, there's still a lot of transformer magnetics that are in play. There is, uh, in terms of if you have still few amounts of rotating machine in the system, you can have torsional stress on them. Uh, there are loads which need precise control of frequency. So if you have a paper mill, it needs good frequency control. So those are still uh, reasons to have good frequency control. But because you are removing the mechanical time constant, it allows us to do this in a much better manner where you have a lower source time constant, you have faster control capability, 
You could have smart transformers in the network. You could have increased observability. But after all that, we come down to the final question, just because it can be done, should it be done? And there's, there's no general answer for that. It depends on a variety of other factors. And what we can show here is just how it can be done. Uh, and the following question will have to come up later with respect to should it be done. Now, what we started doing was that if we do go about this scenario where we have uh, a lot of the generation resources being inverter-based resources, uh, and even recognizing that there might be few milliseconds delay in communication, and there is filtering time, and there is delay in measurement of frequency uh, and whatnot, uh, because of the fact that these are rapidly moving devices, uh, allowing for faster movement of these devices asks us or, or makes us ask the question, do we still really need to hold on to frequency droop control? So, so droop control, as you see here, with the blue curve was a necessity because the machines are slower moving, you cannot move them fast, and they would fight with each other, so you want the system to come down and settle down at an off nominal frequency value after the occurrence of an event, and then slowly through secondary frequency control, you bring that value back up. But with inverters, because they are so fast, you can actually shorten the time of that primary frequency control region to almost zero. And in this case, when you have all inverters in the system, using a concept which is similar to distributed slack bus, where in a distributed slack bus scenario, if you solve a power flow with a distributed slack bus, you're essentially saying that not all the, the losses and the load is not going to be put upon just one single machine, but it's going to be distributed across multiple inverters. And if we translate or take that concept into the dynamic domain with this distributed slack bus concept, we can get something which is much better than L-shaped actually. Uh, you can get a response which come, makes the frequency come back to nominal uh, almost seconds after the disturbance has occurred. And this is the control that we have been working on. And the previous slide showed the test setup on a much larger system, but to put it in perspective and to put it in terms of energy requirement, we decided to test it out on the small system where we have on the right-hand side, we have a huge amount of inverter-based resources feeding in power into these two load pockets, and you have just one rotating machine present, uh, which is generates a scenario which could be something which is uh, observable very soon. In fact, I think just yesterday there was one interconnection or one uh, one network within the North, within North America which reached which reached 72% instantaneous penetration of uh, inverter-based resources. So this this metric of 85% of the load being met by IBRs could be not far away. Uh, and even though we say 15% met by a single rotating machine, that's just for uh, representative purposes here. But the, the, the concept being put across here is that you have a whole amount of inverter-based resources which are non-controllable as shown by the type three wind turbines, but we just wanted to test out if you have few amounts of battery, the size doesn't matter in this study, but that's something which we have to look forward uh, to further research to how to determine the accurate size. But if you do have few of these resources controlling the frequency in this constant frequency mode with the distributed slack bus method, then would it really work and would it even be able to survive faults and ride through both unbalanced and balanced faults? Now, for an increase in load, uh, this is what we found out that uh, what you see on the left-hand side is just change in active power across the variety of resources, and what you see on the right-hand side is frequency in the entire system. Now, uh, this entire setup was run in EMT, which takes quite a bit of time, so uh, once we got this small amount of startup system startup simulation where we know it is going to settle down, uh, we just applied the disturbance, so even though we would have ideally liked a flat start in the first few seconds, uh, just for the ease of purposes of discussion, we have not gone to that extent. Uh, but what this shows us is that uh, when you have a increase in load in this scenario, in this setup, uh, because of having that kind of a constant frequency control, uh, within around a couple of seconds, a few seconds, your control is able to bring frequency back to 60 hertz, which is very different from what we know as droop control, where it takes a lot of time uh, for droop control and secondary frequency response 
to bring this back up to 60 hertz. But then one asks the question, how much additional energy is required in this perspective? So here, bus four was electric closest to the disturbance, which is why that resource, uh, typical in distributed slack bus scenario where electrical distance plays a huge role, uh, you can have that resource responding more, but how much additional energy does it provide can be easily compared when you compare conventional group frequency response as shown here by the orange curve and our constant frequency control as shown by the blue curve. So the difference in the frequency response is easily observable where the group frequency response re reflects our traditional kind of a response where it's going to go and settle at a nominal value, which is around 59.8 hertz in this scenario, but our uh, constant frequency control based on distributed slack bus is able to bring the frequency back to 60 hertz very fast. And if you observe the active power response for these two scenarios, the, the active power response, the trend looks very, very much similar. And in fact, if you calculate the energy under the curve for these two scenarios, uh, from the time of the event to the time of settling, the additional energy required for the blue curve is only 10 kilowatt hour of additional energy. So for a small incremental energy being injected by the, uh, the inverter-based resource, one can achieve much more superior frequency control uh, in this kind of a setup. Now, this has been applied from our end in, at EPRI to larger systems also, where we had a scenario where we looked at a system which is very replicative or uh, similar to the Texas system it's not the real Texas system, but it's very similar in, in size and structure. And for uh, two subsequent loss of about one gigawatt of generation, the blue curve shows if you have conventional frequency response with all synchronous machines. And the orange curve shows if you have inverter-based resources themselves providing group response. And the green curve shows if you have our distributed slack bus approach, just how fast and tight you can have frequency control uh, with this incremental energy injection. It doesn't answer all questions though because it throws a whole new curve on water system stability. Uh, how will UFLS operate? How would you share power across a variety of resources? And that's something that we are presently working on. So in addition to the distributed slack bus concept that we spoke about, we're also looking at it from the perspective of wide area control and next generation monitoring where we have this entire hierarchical decentralized frequency control where we look at uh, balancing areas or local areas within those balancing areas and we make use of uh, measurements and we make use of communication to quickly change the, the frequency set points and the uh, active power set points of various resources uh, in order to control frequency very tightly. So as you see here with the uh, purple curve which is here, as compared to the red curve or the green curve, you can get a much more tight frequency control by, uh, by allowing these faster control to play a role with very uh, minimal incremental energy being supplied. So I just want to summarize with the fact that we've been known and we have been accustomed to frequency group control, which was a necessity because of the mechanical speed and mechanical variables that were involved with rotating machines. But as we go along to a system which has more inverter-based resources with minimal additional energy, we could probably get much more superior frequency control uh, and, and achieve a tighter controlled system uh, in, in this new paradigm. So Julia, that's about I had. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Uh, we have time for probably two quick questions. Uh, first question was, in order for converter to track change, they need to measure local frequency, uh, which would cause additional delay. Did you consider that? Yeah, so we, we have a few scenarios. Uh, if I may just go back once. So we don't have it in this particular slide, but in addition to this, uh, the first plot that I had showed where there are 10 milliseconds of delay in communication, we actually lumped up and did a few sensitivity studies to look at if your delay in sensing the frequency and delay in communication between uh, these variety of resources going all the way from around 10 milliseconds to around 100 milliseconds, 
uh, which is reasonable for local frequency measurement, uh, around 100 milliseconds delay is uh, quite reasonable, then uh, how does that impact the performance and how the other controller gains, they depend on that delay. So uh, we've, we've, I acknowledge that yes, that has to be taken into consideration and uh, that is something which we have done a little bit work on and we continue to do work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, I'll probably combine two together. Uh, the question was how distributed Slack bus concept uh, can be delivered in reality if it's using wide area control. And there was another question asking about speed of communication, uh, if so. Yeah, so uh, there are two aspects at play here. Now, distributed Slack bus can actually be applied without something, without wide area control. You can apply it at the local level itself. Uh, of course, there it depends upon how you decide that participation factor of each individual resource which is playing a role. The way we have done it is that we track the angle and the frequency together of the inverter-based resource, and then we make use of deviation in local angle with respect to itself and not with respect to another bus. So it's not a relative angle, but it's deviation of local angle, and we use that for distributed slack bus. So that gets a much more superior response without requiring uh, a lot of delay in communication. But in the next generation monitoring setup that we are doing, there we are looking at delay in wide area control measurements and telemetry, and then how we can compensate for that delay by uh, applying some control principles. Thank you, Deepak. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on and see if there is some time left for questions at the end. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ralph Pfeiffer. Uh, he will introduce the perspective of European system operators on grid forming in inverters uh, and the way forward. Uh, Dr. Pfeiffer is the head of the Department of Network Planning and Network Codes and Connection Rules at Amprion, one of the four German transmission system operators. Uh, he is also active at ENSOE, uh, the Association of European Transmission System Operators. There he has been a team leader for grid connection rules uh, for generating facilities since 2009. He currently is a convener of MSOE steering group in charge of development, maintenance, and amendment of uh, European connection and network codes. Ralph, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julia, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon or good evening from Germany to all of you. Um, well, I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, the NCE views on the grid forming in inverters and give you a summary of the recent work on NCE and the next steps we are going to do. I guess uh, since I have 15 minutes only, I uh, need to skip a couple of slides from my presentation, which is otherwise uh, I would have been great risk of uh, exceeding uh, the timeline. Um, so, um, originally I intended to also to introduce to you, uh, well, NCE itself as an association and also the, the upcoming even more ambitious European uh, uh, legislative energy policy framework. Um, so I will rather skip here the advertising part of NCE uh, uh, and move on with a few figures uh, about uh, the energy legislative framework. Those of you who have, who have been last year in the ISIC Spring Workshop in Albuquerque may remember that I presented uh, the, the present framework, the, uh, the uh, clean energy package with, with its, uh, its ambitions to, to introduce and to uh, yeah, accelerate the uh, rest penetration, for example. This will be by far um, exceeded with the ambitions of the new um, European Commission, uh, which uh, uh, was established, um, sorry, going in one, one direction. Um, last year, and now um, uh, the far more ambitious uh, target of the uh, European energy policy is to become climate neutral in 2050. Um, well, one could, uh, I guess, uh, present and discuss an hour about this or even more and uh, what is behind the, the, this Green Deal uh, scenarios and what are the challenges. Um, so maybe that could be interesting at, at uh, a different point in time for you. Um, uh, most importantly um, is um, that the ultimate um, 
target is to become climate neutral by 2000. Uh, 50 and in, in, in the meantime we have uh, also intermediate uh, ob uh, targets for 2020 and 2030 um, which are expressed by the uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions to be reduced, uh, the rest penetration to be achieved, low, uh, um, energy efficiency uh, figures and interconnection targets. Uh, uh, for example, here, uh, uh, one, one, when you talk about interconnection targets, uh, uh, the goal uh, is to have 15% uh, uh, interconnection capacity for 15% of demand uh, between the member states of, of, of Europe. Um, so um, you may recognize that this puts a lot of challenges to, to, to the system, and since the uh, um, energy sector accounts for more than 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions in, in Europe. Uh, uh, the challenge uh, and the efforts to be made are uh, focusing there a lot, uh, which means that uh, we uh, move ahead with uh, uh, REST uh, integrations, uh, which will be even accelerated, uh, even be, even more than before. We will exit from coal-fired generation, uh, we will uh, make additional efforts to keep uh, the uh, energy supply system safe and secure, um, not talking about uh, electricity, but uh, the entire energy sector, and um, um, a further instrument to facilitate these uh, ambitions is that we need the fully integrated, interconnected, and digitalized energy market also expanding, not, uh, not, not only addressing electricity, but energy as such and cross-sectoral aspect in there. Um, as you can hear, see here from the slides, uh, the, 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 a number of uh, challenges and energy and opportunities for the energy uh, sector are summarized uh, in terms of uh, interconnection, integration of renewables, I mentioned already, the increase of energy uh, efficiency, decarbonization, and all these has to come together with an increase and further increased uh, cooperation uh, between the EU member states and regional co 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 coordination and cooperation on all efforts. Um, so, um, all of this contributes and um, uh, even accelerates the, change, the, the transition of the electricity uh, system, transmission system, uh, supply system, um, and uh, leads to an even accelerated displacement of the synchronous, uh, traditional, conventional synchronous generation by uh, rest sources, which are mainly inverter-based power sources. Um, um, a number of uh, uh, or, uh, of um, characteristics how REST changes the power systems is is listed listed here. We move from a centralized system to a distributed power system. A lot of generation will be at distribution levels. A number of European countries are very soon expecting to um, uh, reach 100% uh, uh, instantaneous penetration of uh, of, of REST generation. Um, a quite large number more will be at 50% level. Load flow patterns will change a lot, and uh, we will experience more uh, and more larger and variable power transits about, uh, across the transmission corridors because uh, the rest power sources are mainly located remotely, in particular since we uh, together uh, with the, the, the ambitions of the Green Deal, we move towards offshore uh, uh, for wind generation, since uh, onshore acceptability is, is, is limited, resources are limited, a um, large uh, 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 portion of the uh, wind energy in the future shall come from, from offshore uh, generators. All of this um, uh, leads to a massive uh, uh, increase of uh, inverter-based power sources, station which change the power system characteristics, in particular the dynamic profile, rapidly and significantly. And so he has worked on this topic uh, for, for, for a couple of years now, um, when we, uh, and after we had uh, established 
uh, the, the first set of uh, connection codes, mainly the requirements for generators, um, we, uh, where we had as a non-mandatory uh, requirement, very simple requirement uh, 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 addressing uh, synthetic inertia capabilities only, we then after that experienced or learned that this is by far not as efficient and that we need to dig in deeper into the world of inverter-based power sources. Um, at that point in time, we established a, a, a technical group uh, of experts um, from, from the industry, from, from academia, consultants, uh, power system engineers, uh, TSOs and DSO colleagues who worked on this. And um, this uh, group just recently, uh, uh, earlier this year, had published its report where it addresses all the challenges uh, uh, associated with the high penetration of inverter-based power sources and also possible system or not possible definite system needs uh, which result from them and which uh, and refer future requirements we need to address to uh, uh, to yeah system users to be capable of for uh, being uh, ha having a supportive uh, supportive uh, behavior um, with regard to uh, system security and reliable system operation the challenges as the, the, the group has identified, there are a number of six listed here, um, which uh, uh, we have elaborated on deeper is the, the reduction of the inertia of the system, the increased risk of system split, in particular for the large interconnected continental uh, Europe um, uh, transmission system. Um, this risk is a uh, is at stake, and uh, 15 years ago, or 16 years ago, we uh, we, we had we had uh, 14 years ago we had such a, such a system split. So it's not uh, uh, not unrealistic. Things can happen, and the risk even increases because of the uh, uh, increasing large uh, long distance power transits. We experienced a lot uh, a reduction of uh, short circuit power levels, uh, reduced rotor angle stability is an issue, reduced water stability, and the risk of you know, harmonic instabilities due to the fast dynamic behavior. Um, all of these uh, six aspects you can elaborate deeper on, um, uh, more in detail on. For example, this is just a recapturing as, as a summary on something which I reported more extensively last year in, in, in my presentation in Albuquerque about uh, the decline of the system inertia um, uh, in the 2030 and 2040 system development uh, scenarios of N N N so we where we see that it is a significant risk and a number of member states needs to be alerted about this and needs to prepare countermeasures um, to be able to mitigate uh, uh, assist, uh, uh, events, incidents which are related to low, low um, inertia. Um, short circuit power level, uh, some details here about this. I will not go through the details here now due to the uh, limited time, but um, uh, Slides will be circulated anyway, I guess, afterwards, so everybody can read and contact me if further questions arise on these matters. Same for voltage uh, stability issues, um, also uh, a number of uh, aspects and uh, uh, observations related to this, um, uh, for example, reduced fault rate through. Uh, capabilities in, in, in future we would uh, ex experience uh, so and uh, much faster uh, response which will be needed uh, due to the dynamics by inverter-based power sources uh, to avoid uh, voltage and system collapses. Well, at a glance, uh, here, is, uh, here the, the, the six identified uh, challenges or causes are listed again and, uh, and a number of con consequences associated, associated uh, to, to them uh, and, uh, this, um, and all on these challenges and consequences, we need to find some answers. And the answers, um, of course, in, uh, are, are manifold and different when, when you whether you got the long-term effect or some long uh, short-term effect or long-term and sustainable measures. 
um, on, the, on the short term, you have to find, let's say, operational solutions, uh, use uh, available technologies uh, um, to mitigate, um, the, for example, the loss of inertia by synchronous condensers, uh, the, as this is available to technology. Uh, you can yeah, at some times adjust or tweak uh, grid connect, uh, connection code requirements, establish new market product and ancillary service for fast frequency responses and so on. And on the longer term, you need to talk and you need to think about new technologies to come in and uh, new and sustainable solutions um, to be found and to be established and to be defined. And one of these aspects uh, and solutions and uh, conclusions from also this uh, technical expert group was to introduce and to uh, in future the the, the uh, um, feature of grid forming control. Uh, the work uh, of the experts has shown that in future we should distinguish between three classes of uh, 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 capabilities or features of, 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 of generators uh, in the system because not all um, capabilities or features are, are needed by every single unit, um, but a number of units need to be, let's say, uh, provide capabilities to the benefit of all. So um, the distinction was, was then made between class one generators where we address or which shall cover some basic functions, which means that they shall be able to operate stably and, and autonomously over the typical operating ranges of frequency and voltage and provides the basic controls, uh, the basic frequency uh, uh, related behavior by the uh, LFSMO, limited frequency sensitive mode at over frequency um, functionality. And this is typically what we expect from the smallest generator in the system, so at, at, at domestic levels, PV installations and so, to operate stably um, and to, yes, to have these basic cap cap capabilities. Advanced capabilities are required to all other uh, generators uh, in, in the systems, uh, typically we, as we had introduced in the uh, requirements for generators network codes, four types called A, B, C, and E. As I say, type A shall, shall be able to do the basics and the advanced control capabilities or, uh, on, and system supportive behavior is to be expected by all the other others type B, C, D, B, C, and D power pack modules and also HVDC converter stations are capable of, uh, of these features uh, which you can read here uh, like uh, Fort Wright 2 capabilities, uh, uh, voltage control both at steady state and dynamic level, in advanced frequency control, damping provisions and fast forward current injection for um, uh, uh, stability after uh, incidents to the system. On top of that, um, seven features have been identified as, let's say, kind of, you can also call it premium capabilities, uh, uh, where uh, a certain percentage, and typically we talk about the range of 20 to 30 percent of, of the generators shall have these capabilities, these uh, very much or advanced uh, capabilities which are needed to be able to entirely replace synchronous generation. So you do not, uh, when you need to operate a system without relying on synchronous generators, you ha these features need to be covered by the so-called class three generators. The, com the, 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 the functions uh, we expect from them, the seven ones identified by the expert group is to create system voltage, to contribute to uh, inertia, uh, to contribute to fault levels, counter harmonics, and so on as you can read here. And these uh, are set in, uh, also in the bottom of, of, of this um, um, diagram here shall be uh, uh, covered or sh uh, shall be provided by a selected number of, uh, of generators, so by definitely not all of them. And as or, or, uh, also Deepak already said in the beginning of, of his presentation, there is no common definition of grid forming. Our understanding and our uh, under uh, definition of grid forming in future will be associated to 
uh, these class three generators which have the capability to provide these seven features as, as, as identified. Um, so um, that's the situation. So uh, with, with the report available, uh, by the tech ICE report available, it was uh, published end of January. Um, it is a public report. It theoretically, I have to say, can be downloaded from the NCE website. Possibly it is not possible to download it right now because NCE has been subject to a cyber attack and uh, therefore uh, many uh, uh, features of the website don't work uh, uh, currently but uh, will be established uh, re-established in the next weeks. So you may still check there at NCE if you're interested uh, in the report and do not have it yet ready. And this a report shall be um, um, well uh, an instrument or uh, to be used to overcome on what uh, uh, is has been described by uh, Julia in her presentation to the wind integration workshop in Dublin last year as a circular, circular problem. I used the, uh, I've stolen the the illustration here because I like it a lot because it perfectly de de defines. Um, the current current situation that uh, as long as uh, we have no clear uh, specifications or def uh, requirements at hand for the manufacturers, they cannot develop uh, the relevant products and um, cannot enable the, the operators to request those features uh, for system operation, which leads to operational constraints, which makes it difficult to further increase the uh, um, penetration of um, inverter-based resources and uh, uh, finally shrinks the market of, of, of the manufacturers. So this has to be overcome and um, the, the, the NCE report and the outcome of the working group, the technical group, is a first step towards that direction to overcome it. And, and the next steps to be done here is um, are illustrated here by this slide um, and uh, some uh, conscious considerations will have to be made now because um, what the report shows is that we do not have uh, or uh, that the need of grid forming capabilities uh, is no longer questioned. I guess uh, you can, this is quite, quite obvious right now that uh, they are needed as such but the question, next question which arises is how shall they be introduced and how shall the requirements associated with grid forming capabilities be formulated and, and introduced? There are two options to do this, uh, to do this we, we believe, uh, and we need a differentiated view. The, the, the choice to be made is between uh, grid forming capabilities which may be mandatorily implemented by connection codes as prerequisite for grid connection or capabilities to be introduced as a market product that they can be offered as, as ancillary services and the requirements um, then shall be understood as pre-qualification criteria to become eligible to such a market. And of course, these two options can be com combined, um, which is the third, third solution then that part of the capabilities may be defined through connection code and other parts may be defined as uh, market services and ancillary services. Um, how to make the choice on how to go ahead, whether to introduce conne grid connection requirements or pre-qualification criteria. Both ways, both options ha have the pros and cons, which are listed here. Here uh, in this table, so on the left hand side, uh, uh, you have some arguments um, for introducing connection requirements or what, what are the typical um, characteristics uh, you would expect from grid connection requirements. For example, if you need something that shall be mandatory for every system user, it's best formulated as a grid connection requirement. Or if it can be defined exhaustively and is of general application, then it, is, uh, it can be clearly described and defined as a connection requirement. And, a, and, and also a very uh, valid argument which is uh, which we also often are faced with by manufacturers that if the ca capabilities are uh, relevant to plant design and come along with uh, a, a certain yeah, need for um, product development engineering to be done before having the, uh, these requirements uh, established in in plants to be 
to be uh, to be sold and to be operated. This is also best to, but done by, by grid connection requirements. On the other hand, uh, uh, free equation criteria and ancillary service may have its benefits if you have capabilities which you need to be um, supplied um, by, by, by a limited number of uh, system users only. So it's not necessarily that everybody has the capabilities, but those who want to enter a market and to have a business case and to see some benefits on offering the services, they, they, they can do it, then they, then they have to fill the pre-qualification criteria. Or if um, capabilities can be exist, delivered within existing plant design or at smaller extensions or uh, uh, modifications at re reduced costs only. That's also an argument for uh, the, the, the way to introduce things as pre-qualification criteria. A number of uh, more arguments are listed here, but I will not address every single of them. So what do we have to do now? Um, um, we have to make our mind. Uh, we have to make conscious decisions and considerations uh, at N2E um, which way to go. And maybe we go both ways. For some uh, parts or, uh, and requirements related to grid forming, we will in, may introduce at connection requirements. Others we may suggest being um, pre-qualification criteria. There's a definite timeline um, for us um, to do this because, um, you know, uh, the uh, connection requirements are defined through the uh, connection network codes, which are a piece of European legislation. And the current set of network codes and guidelines shall be subject to review by 1st of July 2025. This is a deadline given through the Clean Energy Package regulation there uh, that all codes and guidelines shall be revised by them. And we have a, and the European Commission, who is in charge of the legislative procedure, has already clearly indicated that uh, in this time we have only one chance per network code for revision because every change is uh, associated with a, with a complex legislative process then, including the Commission, including the member states, and, and we have uh, eight codes and, and guidelines to be uh, uh, addressed and, and revised within the next five years. And, and all of them have uh, more or less uh, interlinkages between them, which means we have to make conscious decisions because we have only one shot to the target and this shot shall be shall hit the target. Um, so um, this is an important, very important position making now with NCOE, but also other stakeholders think about it um, uh, to bring in their position because every legitimate stakeholder can submit amendment proposals for the network codes um, to the uh, uh, energy uh, agency for the energy regulators, ACER, who then shall consult and consolidate and propose to the Commission. And this formal process uh, is to be expected to start in 20. 21 earliest, which means that we, and as NCOE, like other stakeholders, will have to make our mind and to prepare our position on how to introduce the um, um, uh, grid forming capabilities in the connection codes until end of the year, so that we then can bring things forward to the formal procedure of uh, amending the legislation. So this is uh, what I wanted to present to you on, on European considerations and developments in this context. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think I'll just take up one question. It's more of a comment, but I was wondering if you could uh, provide your point of view. Uh, so the question is, or a comment is, network development needs uh, to take into account the needs for grid forming converters. Uh, as they are different from current inverters and the impacts are different and uh, impacts are also different from synchronous generators. Uh, so this drives need for clear grid code definition for grid forming and transparency as to where um, it is to be accommodated. Otherwise, network constraints will limit markets and ancillary services. So could you comment on that? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I can comment on this very briefly because I can fully uh, subscribe to this statement. Uh, um, uh, system needs define it, and, and um, 
um, within Ponzi system needs, well, we, we cannot simply uh, define and say everything needs to be addressed by the uh, uh, through uh, uh, the system usage uh, uses uh, by requirements. We also need to make our own homework as uh, TSOs to to uh, define what uh, kind of events shall be manageable in future, um, which incidents we can manage, for example, system splits, uh, to, to which extent, which load imbalances, um, which rock-offs are affordable, so what, what do would, on the other hand, would we have to do, for example, to limit rock-off to the system, to introduce inertia, um, not only from, from system users, but also to, to, to do it ourselves with our own installation. So we can all add to this by, by synchronous condensers as, a, as our own equipment. So, so it's, it's, it's a mixture of that. It is not only an easy task of defining requirements to system users from the system needs, but also to do our own homework as system operators in this context. All right, thank you, Ralph. Uh, and also feel free to answer any remaining questions in the question window, Deepak was doing that as well. And in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next presentation. We are coming back to the US with that. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Ryan Quinn. Uh, Ryan will talk about industry focused on uh, bulk power system connected inverter based resource modeling. Ryan is lead engineer at North American Electric Reliability Corporation, where he supports the electric utility industry tackle emerging reliability risks. In particular, Ryan is coordinating NERC uh, IRPTF task force focusing on uh, reliability, uh, reliably integrating inverter-based resources to the power supply system. Uh, he is also coordinating NERC spider working group focusing on ensuring bulk system reliability with increasing amounts of distributed energy resources across North America. Ryan, uh, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Julia, and th thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, some of the things we've been interested in at, at NERC and, and through our IRPTF group on uh, specifically related to, to modeling um, and, and system studies that are taking place and some of the work we've been doing through, uh, you know, our various activities. So we're all pretty well aware of the, the infamous disturbances and in the reports that have come out, the Blue Cut Fire, Canyon Tube Fire, fire Palmdale Roos, Angeles Forest disturbance, um, and the two subsequent alerts that came out on uh, following the Blue Cut Fire and the Canyon Tube Fire. Uh, specifically on the second alert, uh, we identified some significant challenges related to modeling, uh, particularly for solar PV resources. And so I think this presentation will be hopefully a little humbling, but uh, I'm really trying to speak to the, you know, the grid operators, transmission planners, uh, equipment manufacturers, generator owners, et cetera, um, getting away from these forward-looking 100% penetration conditions, realizing that we have major challenges on our doorstep that we need to address before we, you know, even in think about encroaching on high penetration or 100% penetration levels. Uh, following those disturbances, we, you know, put together these guidelines and we've talked at length about, about these guidelines. The one on the left in 2018 focused on the recommended performance for bulk power system connected inverter-based resources since we didn't really have uh, much in, in the way of requirements related to uh, specifically how we want inverter-based resources to behave in North America. And uh, that sort of led to the activities that are now underway with IEEE P2800. And then the second guideline there on the right was sort of a subsequent follow-up to really provide clear guidance to transmission service providers on how to improve their interconnection requirements for bulk power system connected inverter-based resources, really just to bring clarity and consistency to those resources and, and kind of a mirror image of the, the first guideline on really focusing on how we can build those requirements into the interconnection requirements and the FAC process, the NERC FAC 1 and FAC 2 standards process. Uh, and a big part of that was related to modeling. So if you look in the, uh, the, that second guideline I mentioned, there's a whole chapter on various types of modeling issues that, that we provided guidance on through IRPTF. Uh, talked about model, uh, timing and quality of the models that are submitted during the interconnection process steady state modeling, positive sequence dynamics modeling, short circuit modeling, EMT, and then benchmarking EMT models with the conventional positive sequence models. So a lot of useful material and a lot, and I think it's really helped the industry move forward in, in building up and beefing up their interconnection requirements and their study processes to make sure we are reliably integrating these resources, particularly during the, the initial study process. So what I want to talk to you all about today, though, is this technical report that 
hopefully we'll get approval on uh, very soon. It's in draft format now, but it's in the very final stages of approval at the planning and operating committees. Um, and this is really focused on modeling and studies that have under, been undergone by IRPTF over the last couple of years. Um, the topics there you can see listed on the left, the findings that we found following the, the NERCLR process, uh, industry efforts to update these dynamic models, uh, the WEX Solar Modeling Advisory Group that's now underway working on trying to improve dynamic models in the West, challenges related with MOD 26 and 27 standards that were identified by IRPTF, uh, the growing need for EMT modeling, improvements to the interconnection process, and then the uh, some stability studies that have been performed by IRPTF. So I talk a little bit about some of these topics. I can't go into in-depth on all of them, but I did want to cover some uh, with, with you all here today. So this is a good example from Southern California Edison. This is back in 2019, September, uh, when we were crafting up this section of the report, but the, the points are still very valid. So it's hard to read the, the figure and that'll be shared and you can look at the presentation later. But the key points here are, we sent out the NERC alert and that directed entities to take certain actions. And what we, one of the things we identified was that a number of, of generating units, generating owners, uh, didn't really respond to the alert the way we had expected them to in terms of providing updates to existing plant performance, update models for existing performance, and then proposed models for changes that could be made to the facility. Uh, what we did find was that the majority of units, particularly solar, uh, specifically solar, are using momentary cessation, which we identified as a reliability challenge. And in this case, which is a great example, and again, this is back in September, every model that was provided was deficient. It's not a majority of models or some models. Every single unit that was provided to the transmission planner and planning coordinator that was reviewed had a deficiency in it. Not a single model was provided that was deemed acceptable. So SCE, like many other utilities, really started looking at, well, what are our tools? What tools do we have in our tool bag to try to fix this problem? Not a lot of resources are subject to the NERC reliability standard. Entities have had challenges using Mod 32, Requirement R3 to identify technical concerns. And so now KISO has really kicked off a, a great process where they are using their uh, business practices and their market rules to enforce monetary fines on units that do not provide updated models and deficiency or cure, quote unquote, cure these deficiencies within a timely manner. Uh, I think KISO has really identified that having so many models that are not accurately representing reality is a significant reliability concern, which is great because it is very indicative of the outages that we had, say, in 1996. So I think we're headed in the right direction, but hopefully other utilities are learning from those examples uh, that this is fairly serious when we have substantial number of models out there that don't match reality. So at NERC here, we, we did some follow-up following the data that we collected on the alert, and then we reached out to TPs and PCs uh, specifically to get more information on what they found. And I'll just want to run through these really quick it's provided in a lot more detail in the, the report. But PPs and PCs drastically lack data on how inverters are set, how these plants are configured. And there's this trust the model concept where I receive a model from a generator owner and I'm expecting that that model is 100% accurate or as accurate as reasonably expected. And there's no means of verifying that data. When you look at, say, the uh, Proforma LGIA for generating synchronous generating resource, uh, you are required to provide capability curves, D curves, uh, protection settings, spec sheets, all of this stuff, and none of that is required for inverter-based resources. And so that's, uh, I'll talk more about that, but that's one of the potential root causes of this is that there's no data that's provided with a model and entities are essentially supposed to trust that model at face value. And we've learned that that's a significant problem. Uh, there's been minimum, minimal updates that were provided by the GEOs through the NERC alert process that was asked, asked for updated models. As I mentioned, all those models were identified as having deficiencies in terms of recommended changes that could be made to the, the plants and, and updating those models to reflect those changes. Uh, not a single useful model was provided. Uh, we see widespread model problems. Models are not matching the alert data that was provided. So an entity says, I use momentary cessation, but the model has dynamic reactive support being provided in the model. Uh, and that's the model used in planning studies, operating studies, et cetera. Uh, there's fairly minimal outreach to the GOs to get better models. Uh, a number or a significantly large handful of TPs and PCs stated that uh, they didn't do any further outreach when no data was provided. They sort of just uh, called it a day, which is, in my opinion, extremely concerning. 
And the entities that did reach out, like I mentioned, the CAISOs and, you know, SCEs, et cetera, said that in many cases they were, un they were met with unwillingness from the generator owners to cooperate. And, uh, you know, a couple of GOs said, I'm, I'm in compliance with all my standards, so please leave me alone. My models are updated. Uh, even though when you look at the NERC alert data and the dynamic models, they don't match. So what are our capabilities at that point? Because uh, I think industry is struggling with be feeling like they've hit a wall. And unless they go to other forms like market rules and things, they don't have much teeth. Uh, I do have to give credit to the folks like Kaiso, entities like Kaiso, that are being very diligent in, in getting their dynamic models updated, and a lot of work is going into that process. But that's, like I mentioned, using market rules. It's not using their standards. It's not using generator interconnection agreements, et cetera. Um, and not everyone has that, you know, quote unquote luxury. Um, a handful of entities provide, TPs and PCs responded saying that the dynamic models they'd received were updated and, and everything was good. But when we did sort of an objective quick review of the models that were provided and the NERC alert data that was provided, uh, we on our side found that there was notable errors in the data. And so there's concern that maybe the transmission planners, planning coordinators don't fully understand how these models work. Uh, again, we have many experts in the industry and many entities that are very sharp in this type of stuff, but a handful of entities are, are providing very questionable responses. We did get a ton of responses that said, oh, I rely on mod 26 and 27 to verify my models. And so these, these plants have not undergone 26 and 27 testing and therefore the models are not right. And I'll talk more about why that's a challenge here in just a second. So regarding that topic, put really frankly, compliance with mod 26 and mod 27, and this was identified by the IRPTF, uh, subgroup that's been doing a standard review that I'll talk more about tomorrow, but uh, compliance with Mod 26 and 27 does not mean you have a dynamic uh, model that is verified, quote unquote verified, meaning I can trust the large disturbance behavior of that plant. I can easily get a model that matches a 2% bump test to a voltage, you know, a cap switch type event, uh, and I don't have any parameters that are correct in terms of my large disturbance behavior like things like momentary cessation. So this is one of the issues why we have dynamic models where they may be verified, they may have the mod 26, 27 compliance, but it doesn't mean the model's right. It doesn't mean that it, for a bolted three-phase fault out in the grid that the unit's gonna perform in the model as it does in reality. And I think that's one of the main challenges we have. Uh, I mentioned the, the GIAs, we've had discussions in the, uh, the IRPTF world about how do we, you know, what's the root cause of some of these problems? Why have we landed in a world today where most of the models are not matching reality? Uh, and I, I think we heard, of, you know, very regularly that receiving inaccurate models right up front uh, in the interconnection process leads to inaccurate models throughout the process. If an entity is able to get by with not providing the, you know, quote unquote accurate model and it doesn't provide the updates, it's very hard to get an update down the road once the unit is commercially operational. Uh, et cetera. So, as I mentioned, we go back and we sort of look at the LGIA, LGIP and the appendix, and, and we realize that there are uh, very comprehensive information that's required to be provided for synchronous machines. Uh, for wind, there's a couple items related, but they're not really related to, to modeling, and really there's nothing in there for batteries and solar. And I think, we, we think that, that might be leading to some of the challenges that we're facing as an industry to to get very accurate models right up front, at least during the trial operation, the commissioning process into the uh, commercial operation time. We understand there's limitations in the model, expected model settings and things like that during the system impact studies and the, the uh, feasibility studies, et cetera. But once that unit is commercially operational, we know what the equipment is set at in the field. And I think that the models are just not getting updated as they, they should be. Uh, WEC's been doing some work to try to move from these REECB models to the REECA models, uh, or I believe there's a future REECD model uh, that's in the works. But uh, as of now, the guidance, you know, I think in the past REECB was created, it was expected that that would reasonably represent solar plants and it was developed under the WEC Renewable Energy Modeling Task Force many years ago. And that model was widely used by the OEMs and they filled out that model and submitted their data as as sort of as they were told by the, the latest and greatest guidance we had at the time. Well, through all this analysis we've been doing as an industry over the last few years, we've realized that our ECB really is not an acceptable model, doesn't represent momentary cessation for those units that are it's applicable to, 
and it's missing some critical voltage dependent current logic and other large disturbance functionality that limits its use and every OEM I've talked to uh, has stated they don't recommend using RECB anymore and I think so new interconnections are probably uh, have updated to using RECA for the time being but when you pull up the WEC base case there's 218 units in the case that are using RECB 56 are using RECA so we got a lot of work to do to try to get those units updated because I'm you know, I bet my money that the vast majority of those RECBs are using momentary cessation or at least were when we did the NERC alert. So the question becomes well who has the responsibility to update those models? The GO provided the model, they're following their requirements under mod 32. The TPPC doesn't really have any requirements to go after entities that have provided bad data. So who's going to pick this up and run run with it and, and get this fixed? That is a lingering question and something that we're taking a very hard look at at NERC to, re to figure out you know, who's, whose responsibility is this? Uh, we're seeing a growing need for EMT. I think we've seen that in many, we've had a number of grid disturbances in North America and around the world where EMT-esque type things have happened uh, in terms of low short circuit strength, controls interactions, control stability. We've continued to hear about these concepts of grid forming. What does that mean? How do we model it? Um, but really what we're seeing is that with increasing penetrations of inverter-based resources, we need much more detailed studies and with those detailed studies come more detailed models. Uh, we really need that during the interconnection process. In all the discussions I've had with the industry, if a plant is put in service and an EMT model wasn't provided, good luck getting an EMT model after the fact. So uh, we've made strong recommendations in the NERC guideline uh, that I talked about in the beginning, uh, highlighting that you know all transmission service providers, TPPCs, should be requiring that an EMT model be provided uh, during the interconnection process once the plant has been fully commissioned and the model is 100% updated and that, that will in, at least ensure that as the grid continues to evolve, a model will be available if and when it is needed when we run into things like low short circuit strength or weak grids unexpectedly. So the challenge we face here is lack of industry expertise, lack of wide area study capabilities, multiple tools, types of tools being needed this all adds complexity to the interconnection study process, the annual study process, et cetera. Uh, and we got a lot, a lot of work to do to overcome some of these challenges. The last thing I'll mention is that uh, we're seeing really, you know, increasingly high penetrations of inverter-based resources. I think uh, Deepak mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, and with that comes challenges in, in much more basic things than we've heard so far in, in these presentations. How do I create a case that's predominantly inverter-based resources? specifically when I've got a whole bunch of distributed energy resources out there as well. How do I set my area interchanges? How, what do I set my generating assumptions at? How do I make sure I'm carrying about a sufficient amount of contingency reserve, frequency response to reserve? How much synchronous inertia do I have in, in our system? That's requiring a lot more coordination with neighboring transmission planners, planning coordinators than, than has ever been done in the past. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that the cases are of high quality and they're actually going to be useful in identifying reliability issues. We also have the added complexity, which is expected with, with the energy storage, both bulk system connected and distributed energy storage of how are we gonna model these? How, how do we develop study assumptions? How do we develop operating conditions? Uh, and the system is just becoming much more variable and with that variability comes increasing complexity. So I'll leave you with that. Um, there's a whole a lot of references here. Uh, but we do have that inverter modeling, inverter-based resource modeling and study technical report that hopefully will get approved, hopefully by the end, end of the next month or so. Um, and and that will, that'll be published and an announcement will be sent out. So uh, thanks again. Um, thank you, Ryan. Uh, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions probably. Uh, one question from consultants specializing in dynamic model testing and tuning. Is NERC developing uh, any further requirements for validating models uh, in other operation modes, uh, for example, faults, et cetera? Uh, grid or generator owners and consultants are at the mercy of manufacturer at this. There was another question related to that, saying that uh, testing of the models may be happening in a, a different set of conditions than uh, what, what, your, what you need to test at. And so could you comment on that as well? Yeah, sure. So I can talk about what I, so IRPTF identified that the, the mod 26 and 27 
activities have challenges in terms of verifying the large disturbance behavior in particular and some of the things that were just mentioned. So uh, they've submitted a white paper. That white paper is going through the, the approval process. Uh, I think it has been approved. And uh, that subgroup is actually in the process of developing standard authorization requests to make modifications to Mod 26 and 27. Now, not from a logistical standpoint, from you know what I've observed and experienced working with the industry over the last few years is that there are other means in which we can get accurate data that does not necessarily require going out and performing a test or putting a fault on the machine, uh, on the plant to verify, quote unquote, verify the dynamic models that are provided. Just having screenshots of inverters and understanding of the plant level controller settings and understanding the protection settings and how each of those dynamic model parameters were verified and making sure that the EMT model is of sufficient quality and that, that the transmission planner understands where that model came from, having any factory test reports from the OEM, et cetera. All of that stuff to me is tenfold more valuable than some artificial test that is performed on a piece of equipment. So I think that semi answers your question. How that ends up happening in terms of the next five years or so as, as NERC standards are sort of revisited, uh, I don't know where that'll land. That's up to the mercy of the drafting teams that are formed. Uh, but I think it will definitely be a hot topic because uh, we're realizing that modeling of these resources is a pretty critical topic and uh, I think something that hasn't got enough attention over the last five years, which is why we've sort of got complacent with uh, you know, the models that we have and the quality of those models that we've received. So we definitely do need some type of verification activity. Uh, the main point is that that verification doesn't necessarily have to require a test, in my opinion. Uh, another related question was, do you also verify small signal performance, frequency dependent impedance of control, et cetera? Uh, the requirements that are in place for at least Mod 26 require that the small disturbance behavior of a dynamic model is verified. Um, in terms of uh, the frequency dependence and those things, it's typically, that's definitely not within the, the bounds of the NERC reliability standard. It's not focused on the NERC reliability standards. Some local utilities might have much more rigorous requirements that require those types of things. And again, every transmission planner, planning coordinator under the FAC 2 standard is required to uh, is, is required to develop their own requirements on how that study process looks and they can put essentially anything they want into their interconnection requirements uh, per the FAC standards. And so we've made recommendations that much more detailed, you know, type of model verification be required to get the type, you know, to, to address those challenges that we've seen thus far, I guess, just leave it at that. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we'll move on and Ryan, feel free to answer questions in the Q&A window um, as we proceed. Uh, our you. next two presentations are very related to what Ryan was just talking about and it's about uh, models and tools uh, and performance. So the next presenter is uh, Fred Juan and he'll talk about reliability and security assessment performance models and tools in ERCOT. Fred is a manager of regional planning uh, at transmission planning at ERCOT. His work, uh, his and his team's work, uh, mainly focuses on uh, IBR model improvement efforts and development of option planning tools to facilitate reliable operation at high penetration of inverted waste resources. Fred, take it away. Hi. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, really well. Okay. Thank you. So thanks for having me uh, today. So for, for the time being, I think uh, the, the focus here today is to share uh, several examples on our practice and uh, some ongoing activities uh, we have in ERCA uh, related to the uh, inverter resource, inverter-based resource connect to our transmission grid. So kind of as, as usual, before I jump to like those details, I think for the people who may not be familiar with ERCA system, uh, these slides kind of try to provide a very quick high-level overview about uh, the uh, ERCA transmission grid. So ERCA is one of the three interconnections uh, many of you are very familiar with. Uh, I think uh, we uh, couldn't, uh, like uh, historical the peak demand uh, was like a seven, close to 75 gigawatt uh, recorded uh, last year. And uh, 
in in terms of uh, interconnection base, uh, we do have uh, like a DC type connection to our neighboring, but it's very small, uh, like a relative small amount. It's less than uh, close to 1.2 gigawatt compared to the seven close to 75 gigawatt uh, the load that we have. So it's very really from the operation perspective, uh, we really manage the voltage and the frequency, uh, rely on all the resources within the ERCA. Uh, it's very limited support, uh, and also kind of say no support from the DC tie uh, for the voltage and the frequency support. So in addition to that one, we do have uh, a lot of uh, renewables, especially the, the wind generations. So here kind of uh, as a record, as a, from instantaneous perspective, uh, the, the highest uh, wind generation output uh, we recorded is early this year, is 20 gigawatt. Uh, from the penetration perspective, in terms of uh, the load serving at the moment, I think we exceed 55% is really toward to the 60% um, moving forward. That's kind of how we expect it. So that's really kind of summarize uh, our, our systems are in terms like a, almost like an independent system with uh, kind of exceeded 50% penetration from the renewable perspective. So bef before I kind of go into like, a, okay, the modeling performance and the tools perspective, I think uh, the following few slides just kind of selected uh, several very high level examples about uh, what is the reality support of functionality or requirement uh, for the inverter based resource connected to the car system. And uh, these should uh, likely are very similar to many other regions you have, uh, but it's good to highlight it before we jump into the tool and the uh, assessment part. So for, for inverters, the wind farm, solar farm, uh, they, they are required to provide reactive support. Uh, and uh, really, at a the kind of at a point of interconnections, they need to be capable of provide plus minus 0.95 power factors, including leading and lagging. And you can see on the figure here is like a, a rectangular or the square, the shape of the reactive support, not the triangular one. In addition, our lay uh, those reactive support uh, they must be dynamics. And I think recently we introduced the kind of voltage support from energy storage perspective, which they will be required to provide a voltage support uh, at the full range from 100% charging to 100% discharging. Uh, in the full range, they are required to provide a voltage support. From the frequency perspective, uh, for, for IBRs connect to ERCA, they are also required to provide a frequency support. Uh, it's, the exploitation requirement is very similar to a typical synchronous machine, kind of provided the governor-like response. Uh, so the, the one on the left kind of to show us like an example for the low frequency for a rain resource to uh, increase the power during the low frequency event. And uh, the one on the right is uh, kind of uh, the other way. And we have a high frequency uh, where the uh, IBRs, they are required and they are capable to reduce the output to uh, help the frequency recovery. So something we'd like to highlight here is uh, currently the IBRs connect to ERCA, they are required to provide a frequency support when they have had room. So it's not required for them to must keep the headroom unless they are they participate in the ancillary service. So typically, if a project they always operate at the maximum output at the time being, uh, they likely may not have enough headroom to increase output. As a result, they are they don't need to provide the support. However, during some condition, as an example, during the constraints, uh, they operated not at the maximum output for the time being. And they have headroom and they are required to respond to the frequency. So the previous two is more like a steady state normal operation perspective. So during the dynamic or during the disturbance, uh, also all the IBRs, they need to have the voltage and frequency rise through capabilities. And uh, just kind of follow up what Ryan mentioned earlier is the moment, momentary cessation is also not allowed uh, for the resource connector ERCA. So 
for the resource connect to ERCA during the initial in the connection study uh, process, we will review and examine the model capability also circulated with the owner to emphasize all the requirements and ensure those capabilities can be provided and the, the undesired performance can be addressed or even eliminated before they come into the car system. So once we have you know, kind of all the expected the typical performance and the reliability support of functionalities, so this slides kind of show very high level uh, from the beginning, the resource interconnection process going to the planning stage and operations. What are the typical uh, reliability assessments and the associated models? Uh, we require the IBRs to provide it to us for uh, study and assessment purpose. And uh, I think these are also can be very similar to many regions. Uh, so I just kind of highlight the one. So IBRs connect to ERCA, I think from the at the interconnection process, they are required to do the steady state dynamic show circuit, uh, which is very typical. In, the, in addition, they are required need to perform the reactive power studies to demonstrate that they can meet uh, 0.95 power factor requirements uh, from their design perspective. And they also need to show their capability to be able to ride through the disturbance uh, from for low voltage and high voltage perspective. And uh, in addition, because ERCA, we do have a series of capacitors in our system to facilitate the transfer capacity. As a result, depend on the inverter-based technologies, if the resource connect to the series capacitors, they are required to perform the SSR, uh, subsynchronous resonance study. And this is where the PSK model is required for inverter-based resource to provide the model at the interconnection stage. So going to the planning stage uh, is also very typical analysis and assessment tool, tool set and the kits we have here. So do the steady state dynamics, I think there's something to highlight here is, I know, uh, following Brian mentioned earlier, depend on the areas, uh, certain area with high penetration of inverter based resource concentrated one, the weaker grid uh, stability challenges uh, need to be identify or at least need to be addressed. So as a result, uh, in ERCA, we start to consider and to perform the PSK studies, and mainly uh, for the weak areas we identify to ensure uh, the assessment can capture uh, all potential control instabilities or oscillatory response due to the system strength issues. So moving to the operations uh, for offline tools is still very typical, uh, st typical steady state and the uh, OG stability analysis. But for the online tools, uh, in ERCA, we, we do have a real time uh, OG stability analysis assessment. Uh, it's running uh, every 10 minutes uh, to capture address or more like a steady state like a voltage stability analysis. And uh, with the increasing the inverter based resource connected to a system, the dynamic stability challenges uh, associated with the uh, installations need to be addressed. So, to better address and identify manage the stability constraints in real time, so we are currently considering and under the say, development to implement the real time transient stability assessment tools as well. So this just kind of use one example we have, and the following slides kind of to show how we use the tools uh, in both planning and operations to manage the reliability and the security in the panhandle region as an example in ERCA region. So the reason I use the panhandle as a region as an example is kind of uh, one, this area, uh, as you can see the map is really the northwest corner of the tech of the ERCA system. So in the corner in the panhandle regions, uh, we have uh, more than 10 gigawatt capacity, uh, really the majority of their wind resources, uh, but we also see the increasing uh, solar projects connected to this area. And uh, this area is far away and remote from the synchronous generator and load center, which typically in the central part and uh, the coastal part of the Texas. So 
really from this perspective, the, the panhandle, nearby pan, the panhandle region, if you look at that region only, it's is, is really 100% inverters, and they need to transfer 100 miles power to the load center in the central and the coastal area in Texas. So from that perspective, focus on that region is really 100% penetration. So the related uh, challenges and the need, such like a weak grid, voltage stability, and the oscillation, uh, we put the syn two synchronous condensers in a pen handle uh, to provide a system strength and also to provide dynamic support. So we do have a two synchronous machine in terms of synchronous condensers in the pen handle region. Uh, so the associated uh, synchronous machine related uh, stability, like angular stability into area mode, also need to be addressed. So how, how do we address this one uh, from the planning and uh, operations perspective? So this kind of show kind of very high level, what are the tools we use and uh, how we kind of to identify and address the stabilities for the panhandle, for the panhandle regions. So on the planning side, due to it is a weak grid area, so we do perform stability from stability perspective, we perform the dynamic stability, typically we use a PCC tool in ERCA region. We also use a PSK studies uh, to ensure we have enough details in terms of controllers, uh, DPL, all this one. And uh, we also have a reset to do the voltage stability assessment. So in this case, we uh, in ERCA for the pen handle perspective, we introduce the weighted show circuit ratio uh, index uh, for the purpose to uh, have a, a way to assess and uh, quantify the system strength in the panhandle regions. So similarly, the similar tool they are applied in operation tools to really manage the stability constraints in the panhandle, uh, take advantage of the real-time tool, consider the real-time conditions. So in real-time operations, we do have uh, WSCR, WSCR tools calculate the real-time system strength, and uh, also uh, online VC tool to calculate the typical steady state like what is stability. The, we are in the process uh, to implement the, the real-time T-set. Uh, hope to be able to perform the real-time uh, dynamic stability to better capture this real-time condition and the associated uh, stability limit in real-time. So we start one, so want to share kind of a, a few of some ongoing practice and activities we are thinking related to the inverter-based resources connected to ERCA. So uh, as Ryan mentioned, and uh, this is our current practice right now, is all the inverters connected to ERCA, they are required to provide the PSK models. So also we recently uh, ha have a new process and uh, uh, kind of approved by our, through our stakeholder process uh, is not only they need to provide a model. So in this case, uh, we use a positive sequence, take a TCC dynamic model as an example. So when a dynamic model is provided to ERCA and the, the transmission company in ERCA region, the associated model quality test need to be provided as well. And the model quality test will include a break start and a small voltage disturbance, as an example, plus minus 3% of voltage deviation. Also, the large voltage disturbance to demonstrate layer capability from LVRT to HVRT, and also the associated frequency disturbance response uh, out of the dynamic model. As an example, apply 0.3 hertz deviation to see uh, can the model respond to the frequency deviation and will they re properly respond to the frequency response? The last one, because we do have a concern with more and more renewables connect and concentrated to the area, the weak grid certainly is one we need to identify and uh, need to address. So we also uh, will require the dynamic model, we will need to go through a system strength test. Uh, for the purpose to get a better understanding of the dynamic behavior out of the dynamic model under different system strength conditions. So these are kind of the ongoing uh, activities we recently work with our stakeholders to improve the dynamic model qualities. We 
to facilitate this one, we do have a tool developer and uh, kind of share with our stakeholders to perform this test. And then moving forward, as Ryan mentioned, the many comments here today is we do see the need to continue to work with our stakeholders, uh, find a way to continue to improve dynamic models, uh, including the accuracy and the adequacy. So the, the other one kind of, kind of to, to share is the ongoing activities and the practice for the weak grid area, uh, especially concentrated through the inverter-based resources. We, st we see the need and start to conduct the stability analysis, including both PSC and PSK. And uh, so from the PSC perspective, uh, recognize the, the, I would say the potential challenges of the gen generic models in ERCA region, user-defined model is, is allowed. And uh, most of the time, they are recommended by the vendors uh, for the weak grid applications. So although this kind of allow us to be able to run a PSC uh, for a weak grid condition, uh, as long as the model is adequate, but uh, after the ongoing effort in the industry to continue improve the generic models, I think is underway right now. So hopefully in the future, we will have a, a more uh, powerful and robust generic model to be used uh, for the weak grid application. So although we start to perform the PSK analysis, uh, although it's not ERCA wide, but it's a pretty big region wide, uh, the panhandle of the examples. So the most recent ongoing panhandle PSK study we are doing, we're currently working on right now, is we include a 10 gigawatt uh, inverter-based resource projects. So in other case, we do we need those 50 projects. They are represented by 62 vendor-specific PSK models. So be able to run that machine, that case, uh, we need to kind of specialize the machine with a multi multiple threads to perform the PSK analysis. Even so, to perform one contingency in PSK as an example here. Uh, it took us 1.5 hours. So really, the, the, the complexity and the time-consuming part uh, really is, is certainly is a concern, especially if the need become, uh, I would say, the, the area need to be assessed become bigger and bigger, then uh, the potential need even for the future operations and real-time applications, um, we may we may hit a really a challenge to see how we can perform the analysis in real time. So the other one I kind of want to share with group is similar to earlier, uh, kind of Ryan's point is with more inverter-based resource connected to the system, uh, so it increased certainly the, the complexity, not only in a generation dispatch, but I think uh, some one thing we do recognize and uh, the one we are continuing to try to improve our process is the voltage coordination in terms of the case conditioning or how what is the best voltage profile to start with uh, it become a challenge as well. So we are currently working on a project, really try to develop a multi-hour uh, look ahead of reactive coordination tools. Really the purpose is try to optimize the reactive power controls such as shunt generator voltage profile and the SVC setting points. Uh, not only a single snapshot, but be capable across a multi-hour intervals because of the variation of the renewables on a daily basis or on hourly basis. So those are the ones currently under undergoing right now. We expect this one to be capable, available for both planning and operations to better use the tools and uh, study more scenarios uh, in a better conditions. So kind of uh, several high uh, key takeaways is really uh, is nothing new, but uh, just with more inverter as a resource connected to the system, the uh, system characteristics definitely is changing. But as a result, a continuous review and the revise the existing performance model and the tools are kind of critical. We will see is tools ready, any new tool we need or any exercise or any practice we need to revise. And uh, the, the challenge here is the timing. We don't have a lot, 
we don't have much time because the inverters they can deploy very quickly. Uh, as an example, the, the average wise in the last few years in ERCA, uh, a typical time for inverter based resource uh, from the beginning to uh, commercial operations, uh, the average time is around 18 to 24 months. And we see the trend that, that, the, that the period is getting shorter and shorter. So I will stop here and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, friend. Uh, there are quite a few questions here. I'll, I'll take a couple. Uh, the first one is, do you impose requirements on the PSCAD model for IBRs in terms of performance, valid frequencies, time steps, model type, or how is it validated? Uh, thank you for the questions. I think uh, right now we uh, recently approved that requirement for the positive sequence model, which is PSSE. And uh, we are currently working with our stakeholders. And uh, one of the proposals right now is, is to include the model quality test, performance test uh, for the PSK models. So it is coming on the way right now. All right. Thank you, Fred. Um, another question is uh, Are there model tests provided by men of, uh, no, wait a second, I didn't want to take this one. Does ERCOT deploy sensors, uh, SCADA PMU, PQ meters at POIs to validate and enforce IBR requirements? So um, the, the layer is a requirement. ERCOT depend on the size and location of the generation projects. Uh, they, we have a requirement to require those pro the projects to install the PMU at the POI. So it is really an application on the resources side. So, and we also have an internal, it's not a requirement, but we do have a practice similar to other regions with PMU application. During the events, we will do, we will examine the PMU recording performance, and especially if the project, if they trip or they have some very other behavior, then we kind of go into the investigation. And that's where the model behavior versus the PMU recording will occur together uh, during that kind of event analysis uh, stage. Thank you, Fred. Uh, yeah, I would ask you to have a look at the reminder of questions and answer those that uh, you would like to answer. And we'll move on in the interest of time. Our next presenter is uh, on the similar experience from uh, Australia, uh, from Dr. Babak Badrzadeh. Uh, with Australian uh, energy market operator. Uh, uh, Babak is a manager of operational analysis and engineering team uh, at AIMO. Uh, the team's focus uh, areas include developing detailed power system simulation models, assessing and addressing new and emerging system security challenges, power system restoration, and operational impact of distributed energy resources. He is also a convener of three secret working groups. Robert, take it away. Thank you, Julia. Uh, hi, everyone. Hopefully, everyone can hear me well. I try to be quick so that uh, we have time for questions uh, more. What I'd like to discuss uh, for uh, today are uh, to share two practical examples from our uh, national electricity market that uh, we operate. In the first example, I'll discuss some of the stability challenges associated with uh, increased penetration of uh, inverter-based resources in various parts of our system under uh, the conditions of uh, low system strength. And on the second one, is completely the other way around. I'll try to share with you some of the success stories that we have had in terms of uh, practical deployment of uh, inverter-based resources to enhance the overall power system security. Going to the uh, first example, our experience uh, is that uh, there is often a coincidence of two factors as far as the locations at which the inverter-based generators are connected. The first one is uh, being far uh, from large and capable synchronous generators. And the second one, uh, which coincides the first most often, is being in uh, close proximity of other inverter-based resources. The combined effect of uh, these two factors uh, manifests itself in a reduction in the system strength available to the inverter-based resources. 
And that's what uh, we've tried to highlight uh, in this graph, which shows the available system strength in various parts of the national electricity market that we operate, with the darkest colors representing areas with the lowest available system strength. And uh, what uh, occurs most often is that these areas uh, attract the best uh, wind and solar resources. And what it has meant in practice is that uh, connecting to such part of the network has uh, frequently required changes uh, uh, in the inverter control system, or at least some of the control parameters, which I'll provide an example as we go along. This graph shows a typical example that we have been seeing in different regions that we operate uh, over the uh, past 12 to 18 months, uh, whereby uh, we see sustained low frequency post fault oscillations uh, that caused by inverter base resource that wouldn't otherwise uh, be present in the uh, power system. These oscillations typically uh, between 7 to 10 hertz and have been predicted very accurately by the uh, wide area EMT model of the power system that uh, we have developed internally uh, last year. These oscillations are not acceptable uh, because uh, firstly they are in breach of the system security and physical requirement and secondly uh, due to uh, potential adverse impact on some of the uh, loads or customers that require a level of uh, purity of supply. To understand whether or not uh, these oscillations are real or might simply be a modeling artifact, we conducted uh, some system level testing at different times. And this just shows an example whereby the testing invoke uh, opening and switching a number of uh, nearby transmission line that would simply vary the level of system strength available to those uh, inverter based resources. And as we can see here, uh, this is just an example for one particular uh, solar farm that uh, the correlation between measured and simulated response is uh, quite good. Uh, the simulated response again is based on detailed uh, EMT modeling. And this gives us confidence on validity of the conclusions that we are making in terms of how to plan and operate the power system for any given what-if scenarios. Now that we have confirmed this problem is real, is not a modeling artifact, what solutions are available to us? We consider three mitigation options almost concurrently, but some of them would take longer to implement as opposed to some others. The first one was the application of an operational constraint, which what it means is that it would limit the number of uh, inverters for each uh, inverter-based uh, resource project that would otherwise uh, be accepted to be online. The second option was considered was uh, installation of uh, or utilization of uh, nearby synchronous machines whether a synchronous condenser or a synchronous generator, if available nearby, which the latter uh, is not often the case. Uh, and the third mitigation measure uh, considered was uh, uh, tuning or retuning the inverter control system, or at least the uh, control system parameters. In the next few slides, uh, I'll discuss in more detail as to what was the uh, key outcome of uh, each of the uh, mitigation measures that we consider in practice. Starting with option one, which is the application of uh, operational constraints. Uh, these graphs uh, show example responses for two solar farms with 100% of inverters uh, available and online, and then that's reduced to 35%. And as we can see very clearly here, Reducing the number of online inverters to 35% would uh, uh, substantially mitigate the level of oscillations that would otherwise be in the experience. For clarity, I've only uh, zoomed in the uh, uh, post-fault response that shows these uh, oscillations. 
An important finding here, uh, which I share uh, the underlying theory in the uh, ESIC uh, fall workshop, so I'm not going to discuss that in great detail now, uh, is the fact that uh, we weren't able to achieve the same performance or anywhere near if we were uh, solely to suffice reducing the total output power of the uh, uh, inverter-based uh, generator. And an extreme that we tried uh, was even if we uh, reduced the total output power to zero while maintaining all inverter-based generators, we would see almost the same level of oscillations that we can see uh, corresponding to the 100% dispatch case that is uh, shown here. Moving to the second mitigation measure, which is the installation of uh, uh, synchronous condensers, because as I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, in this particular instance, there was no nearby uh, synchronous generators, and there were some within a few hundred kilometers, but considering the weakness of the uh, network, those uh, high impedances effectively create a, a fictitious filter that does not allow the system strength or uh, uh, false level, whichever metric we use, to pass through from uh, one location to another. So you would need to have a local solution, which the best uh, available was uh, the application of synchronous condensers. Again, we can see here that uh, as soon as the first synchronous condenser is introduced, the level of oscillation uh, reduces uh, substantially. And by having the second one, that would further suppress the uh, oscillations to the level that uh, we consider acceptable as per the standards uh, that uh, we and the network owners would need to operate against. The underlying reason for this improvement is that a synchronous condenser would increase the level of uh, system strength available to the inverter base resource such that an stable uh, outcome can be achieved without making any changes to the original uh, design or uh, control uh, tuning of the uh, inverter base resource. Last but not least, uh, the use of uh, inverter uh, tuning. Uh, in this case, uh, we have overlaid the uh, results from the previous uh, option with two synchronous condensers, and that can be achieved with uh, no synchronous condensers, but uh, tuning the inverter control system. And we can see that the two uh, responses are fairly similar, and the level of oscillations are negligible, especially with the use of inverter uh, control system tuning. In this case, obviously, a tuning, <coughs> excuse me, would not uh, increase the background system strength available to the inverter-based resource, but what it does is that it would make sure that uh, we can still achieve a stable outcome as far as the inverter-based resource is concerned uh, with recognition that the uh, system strength uh, is lower than that uh, the original design and tuning of the inverter-based uh, resource was conducted. So some changes would need to happen uh, to ensure that the stability is uh, still achieved, and that's both in the uh, small signal and large signal sense. Okay, moving on to the uh, uh, second topic. Uh, this is completely the other way around, where I wanted to share with you uh, some of uh, really uh, excellent value proposition that we see from uh, fast frequency response that uh, uh, provided by inverter-based resources. In this particular instance, we focus on uh, battery energy storage systems because uh, they are uh, primarily the source of fast frequency response uh, based on the fleet that is currently installed in our national electricity market. I'm using uh, South Australian power system as an example uh, in this case. Uh, which is one of the five uh, regions that uh, we operate uh, in our national electricity market. Uh, it has some of the uh, world's uh, leading uh, penetration levels uh, of inverter-based uh, resources. Historically, it has been primarily wind, but it has been growing installation of uh, uh, solar resources as well. 
And it is important to recognize that uh, by high penetration, we are referring to a mixture of uh, larger scale installations as well as a quite significant uh, and noticeable uh, installation of uh, distributed uh, photovoltaics. A key challenge uh, in this system, other than the high penetration, is the very loose uh, interconnection to the rest of the interconnected system that we collectively operate. In this instance, uh, we only have uh, one double circuit AC line and a DC link that uh, interconnects it to the rest of the system, uh, which what it means is that uh, uh, islanding or separation of this system uh, has occurred frequently uh, over the past uh, 20 plus years that uh, this system has been interconnected. We maintain uh, certain quantity and combination of synchronous generators in our South Australian system and indeed all five uh, eastern systems that uh, we operate to maintain sufficient levels of uh, system strength and inertia. So these are effectively 24-7 uh, uh, requirements. What I'm going to discuss in the next slide is the uh, islanding condition, which is uh, a layer above and beyond the uh, system intact condition. And it's therefore fair to assume that uh, additional requirements would apply, uh, which is what I'm going to elaborate in more detail in the next couple of slides. On 31st of January this year, uh, we had a non-credible event. System was uh, intact and uh, in a perfect shape, but uh, we had severe storm that resulted in the entire South Australian power system and a small part of the adjacent network, which is Victoria, which is where I'm personally based in, uh, to be uh, forming uh, an island which extended uh, over 18 days continuously. We never had such a long uh, islanding condition and combined with uh, uh, relatively uh, mild weather, but as you can imagine, January and February are summer uh, here in Australia, uh, which meant uh, fairly sunny conditions uh, as well as windy conditions, and how to manage and operate this system with such high levels of inverter connected generators that is now islanded, meaning that there is no support at all from the uh, adjoining uh, networks that would otherwise be possible. We have uh, developed and implemented uh, almost on the fly a range of uh, measures based on detailed uh, simulation studies on how to manage system security under these conditions, which uh, uh, might uh, warrant a separate presentation in a different time. Uh, for interest of time, I have only focused on one aspect, which is the contribution of uh, uh, battery energy storage systems, and in particular, the uh, fast frequency response that uh, they provide. What we identify is that we needed to increase the uh, combination of uh, synchronous generators that uh, we otherwise have available under system uh, intact condition. Uh, when that was achieved, then uh, the key challenge identified to operate such a power system was to manage and maintain the frequency within the required frequency band when the system is subject to a credible contingency. Before moving on from uh, this slide, the last point uh, I wanted to uh, emphasize here, and this is based on measure responses uh, that uh, uh, as soon as uh, the and in process of system separation, uh, the batteries uh, were connected. Uh, you can see that uh, they provided a fairly fast response, which is faster than one second, uh, which uh, is uh, order of magnitudes uh, faster than what a synchronous generator could provide. This is an important uh, aspect of the value proposition of batteries which I would further uh, emphasize in the next slide, which is in the, the last slide. On how to manage the frequency under this uh, extended islanding condition, uh, we use the uh, uh, detailed power system modeling and simulation. Primarily, it was based on EMT modeling, considering that uh, 
extended oil landing condition means that the system strength and in, uh, to some extent inertia would uh, decline. We wanted to make sure that we achieve the most uh, accurate uh, results. Because the margin of error under such a, a small and oil-landed case uh, is very little. A key finding of the analysis was that uh, we always need a combination of uh, synchronous generators and uh, batteries. Synchronous generators, obviously, first and foremost, needed to provide the uh, system strength. And by virtue of being there, they would inherently provide the physical inertia and they come with some uh, frequency uh, response as well, uh, which is uh, uh, relatively uh, slow. On the other hand, with batteries, uh, they don't uh, provide any phys physical inertia or anything of that nature. Uh, what they do is uh, to provide a fa very fast uh, speed of response uh, for a frequency disturbance, which, as I uh, mentioned previously, uh, to our experience, that is uh, five to maximum 10 times faster than what we can see from turbine governor of a synchronous generator. This graph uh, shows the uh, uh, operating envelopes that we determine from the uh, simulation studies in terms of how many megawatts of FFR is needed uh, in addition to how many megawatt seconds of uh, physical inertia. As we, you can see, there are uh, sets of uh, uh, operating envelope, meaning that there are multiple points in these uh, two curves that we can pick up and operate the power system uh, accordingly. Uh, the question comes up is the efficiency, uh, and by which I mean that, as we can see here, uh, by having an, a small increment uh, on how much of FFR we have in the power system, we can save uh, several hundred, uh, if not thousands, megawatt second of uh, physical inertia. So that is a more of a, a efficiency question. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, the speed of response is really an important factor. And that's why you can see that we don't have uh, any operating point that correspond to uh, zero megawatt of fast frequency response. We have determined a minimum level of fast frequency response that would essentially be needed always uh, in order to be able to uh, arrest a disturbance that uh, could happen within several hundred uh, milliseconds. And we need uh, a source to be able to counter that disturbance within several hundred milliseconds as opposed to uh, several seconds. And uh, the last point, uh, which again, I'm only touching here, uh, that might warrant a uh, a separate discussion at a different time is that question that may come up is that why do we have two sets of curves? As highlighted in the legend, you can see that uh, we have a daytime requirement and a nighttime requirement, and daytime requirement is uh, higher. And this is simply because of the factor that I was mentioning earlier that uh, in some periods we could have uh, a significant uh, penetration of uh, distributed PV which we don't come with the same level of control and flexibility that a large uh, scale uh, PV or uh, wind farm would come up. The expected or unexpected response of uh, uh, this fleet to a credible contingency event uh, would uh, mean that uh, uh, we have a credible contingency larger than the largest credible contingency that we would have otherwise uh, catered for. And to make sure that we can maintain the uh, overall system security, and in particular in this instance, the frequency, within the frequency bands, uh, uh, we need to have uh, higher levels of FFR, as well as higher levels of uh, physical inertia to be able to secure the system, whether a contingency happen in daytime or nighttime. This was all I wanted to share with you for today's presentation. Hopefully you find it uh, useful and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Balak. Uh, I'll, uh, ask, I'll combine two questions into one since they are related. Uh, how weak was the network uh, for this 10 hertz oscillations? What was short circuit ratio? 
and uh, did retuning work for all situations or did it need to be adaptive as short circuit ratio conditions changed? Okay, so I, I cannot actually generalize because we have seen uh, the, uh, these oscillations in three of the main networks that we operate. It's not that we're saying that uh, the short circuit ratio drops uh, below a certain level and that is uh, uh, causing the problem. I think we need to look at it from a different angle is that uh, what is the uh, SDR for which a wind farm or solar farm or battery or uh, HVDC link has been designed for and what is available in the system. And to elaborate this point further, uh, we have seen in some cases that for a short circuit ratio of uh, two or so, we are seeing these uh, unstable uh, responses because of uh, how the uh, inverter tuning was done, which probably did not uh, account for some of the uh, uh, very remote parts of the uh, network that we operate in uh, Australia. On the other hand, we have seen uh, projects that uh, operate uh, stably uh, at uh, SCR values of 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2. Uh, so I'm hoping that this has been basically a lesson on how we work uh, closely with uh, manufacturers that we have excellent relationship to take into account that some of these connections can really be extremely weak. And if that is to be accounted for uh, from beginning, uh, we wouldn't have uh, this issue. So to answer your question, I can't uh, put a specific number, but depends uh, how uh, robust the original design of wind or solar was. And uh, as per discussion with uh, most of them, there is no critical reason why this cannot be achieved. This just needs to be recognized and factored in uh, from beginning in the design. Uh, on the uh, uh, second one, if there would need to be a need for further uh, retuning, uh, we haven't considered that uh, and because there is a framework in uh, Australia that uh, is called the do no harm principle. So the responsibility of generator that uh, is getting connected now to take into account the uh, system condition uh, as it is and, and which other uh, generators that are being connected in parallel. If the system uh, being uh, degraded due to the connection of uh, additional inverter-based generators in the future, the responsibility lies with those uh, uh, upcoming generators, hence the name of do no harm principle that an upcoming generator would need to make sure that they wouldn't adversely impact the uh, uh, response or performance of the existing connection. And if so, the responsibility lies with the upcoming generator to, uh, to remedy the adverse impact that would be caused on the existing plant. Thank you very much, Babak. We'll, we'll move on. We are running over time, uh, but I wanted to encourage you to stay for another 15 minutes for the last presentation of today. Uh, the last presenter is uh, Dr. Shahil Shah. Uh, he will be talking about control system stability for converter-dominated grids. Shahil is a researcher in the Power System Engineering Center of National Renewable Energy Lab. He is leading several DOE projects focusing on stability problems in power systems with high penetration of converter-based resources. Shahil, take it away. Uh, thanks, Julia, for the introduction and uh, having me here. Uh, very interesting presentations today. So, in this presentation, I'll talk about uh, different stability problems in converter dominated grids. Uh, probably I don't have to spend much time on that because of the previous presentations. I'll give a brief overview of uh, impedance based stability analysis method, which has become uh, more attractive for inverter based resources. Uh, in the last, last workshop, I presented uh, the role of production. Uh, in subsynchronous resonance of type 3 wind power plants. Uh, different from that, I will present about reactive power oscillations in wind power plants. And uh, I think this is more relevant now because uh, uh, what happened in UK last year during the blackout event, uh, the National Grid report mentioned that uh, partially the blackout was responsible, occurred because of reactive power oscillations in Honsi, Honsi offshore wind power plant. And uh, finally, I'll talk about uh, some implications of grid farming resources uh, on stability. 
So with, with the inverter based resources and uh, more converters in the power systems like HVDC converters, inverters, wind turbines, uh, we are seeing more stability issues. Uh, previously, the small signal stability was all about uh, uh, local and interior modes, very low frequency oscillations. But now we are seeing because of diversity of controls, fast controls and inverters, a very rich kind of uh, stability problems spanning over the entire uh, frequency range. The main challenges are because of the diversity, each manufacturer uses their own set of controls, unavailability of dynamic models and, and complexity of uh, all these controls. We also need to understand that uh, when we talk about oscillations, we have to differentiate between whether we are talking about oscillations and phasor variables like active and reactive power flow, uh, frequency and voltage magnitude, or phase variables like subsynchronous oscillations and uh, active and reactive power like in torsional oscillations is very different from subsynchronous oscillations in phase voltages and currents which we see in uh, SSR and type 3 wind power plants and both uh, require different kinds of models. I just wanted to highlight this because uh, at certain times we miss this differentiation between the two set of uh, problems. Uh, Impedance-based stability analysis has become more attractive recently, mainly because it doesn't require internal details of uh, controls of inverter-based resources and just uses impedance responses. In this slide, uh, I show very simplistic, uh, uh, simplified representation of impedance approach, basically uh, where we compare the impedance of two interacting subsystems like a wind power plant and the grid. But there are many variations of this. The impedance can be uh, sequence impedances, DQ impedances, phasor impedances, and there are many different variations. But ultimately, the idea is to uh, look at these inverter-based resources and get from outside and take a black box uh, kind of approach. Uh, mainly because we don't have, most of the times, we don't have a good uh, dynamic models uh, covering all control functions. And uh, even if we have them, they're so complex to uh, kind of do any kind of analysis on them uh, through uh, uh, traditional methods. So this slide shows uh, one impedance measurement example we did at Anvil. So it shows a positive sequence impedance response of a four megawatt uh, wind turbine. And this kind of responses can be used for, uh, not just for stability, but uh, for uh, uh, model validation as well. Uh, basically evaluating model at uh, different frequency ranges. The the, the way of uh, the impedance way of doing stability analysis is being adopted by industry. Many utilities are uh, asking uh, OEMs to provide EMT models to conduct this uh, stability study. Uh, Fred mentioned about uh, uh, that Adcode is doing SSR studies using impedance cancel. This is this is now being adopted more and more by the industries, and uh, some utilities have organized approach for uh, at. Uh, dealing with this uh, uh, new stability problem. And other utilities, they do more through an, uh, in an unorganized manner through uh, grid integration studies. What you see on the bottom right side is a plot of uh, uh, comparing impedance response that we measured at Andrel for a four megawatt wind turbine and a PS cut model, model from OEM. So impedance response can also be served as a very good tool for uh, doing model high fidelity model validation. Sometimes. If we do just uh, validation through uh, a dynamics event or transient event like fault, it may not capture all the rich dynamics at different frequencies, but this way uh, we can validate model at, uh, at, at a broad frequency range. Uh, switching gears a little, so I'll talk about reactive power oscillations between wind turbines. So what you see here is uh, simulations from uh, uh, for a wind power plant. Uh, the models are basically uh, ex vendor supplied models. So basically, it has all the control functions of wind turbines embedded inside them. And we observed that there were reactive power oscillations from turbine to turbine. The two turbines were exchanging this uh, reactive power as high as one megawatts. When we tested this turbine in laboratory, we found that indeed the wind turbine has some reactive power oscillation mode. So uh, the left bottom plot shows uh, the reactive power output of the wind turbine when, when the voltage at its terminal was given a step change of just 1%. And, and the behavior is, resembles very closely with uh, uh, what, is, what was described in the, in the report that came out from National Grid, 
showing J2 power oscillations in Ponzi wind plant in, in, in UK for uh, 10 minutes before the blackout in, in August last year. So this, this, this is a very interesting and a practical problem. Uh, to really understand uh, how do we uh, analyze this kind of oscillation, we, have, we, we are defining impedance in a little bit different way, what we call it power domain impedance, where basically instead of uh, relating voltage to current, the transfer functions are from active and reactive power to frequency and, and, and voltage magnitude. And if we can use this transfer functions to understand low power, active and reactive power oscillations in, in inverter wave sources. So these are the real measurements of the four megawatt wind turbine that I just described uh, of the power domain impedance. Uh, you can ignore all the plot, but just look at the right uh, top right plot where we are seeing a clear resonant mode for in transfer function from voltage magnitude to reactive power. So uh, this this resonant mode is responsible for the reactive power oscillations that we just uh, uh, saw in the previous slides. Interestingly, this this resonant mode can be represented by a simple RLC branch because it's a, as you can see, it like an transfer function can be represented by a simple RLC circuit. So, in the next slide, I will show how we can analyze this in a very simple manner. This kind of oscillations. So, if 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 we interpret reactive power as instantaneous current and the voltage magnitude as instantaneous voltage, we can represent the reactive power dynamics. Uh, uh, through this equivalent circuit that you see on on this slide, uh, on the on the on the left, the two RLC branch represents two turbines supplying the reactive power output. What is very interesting is that an inductive grid behaves like a resistance in in terms of uh, reactive power dynamics. So, what actually is happening is that uh, if, if for an inductive grid, if you push in more reactive power, the, the voltage at the point of interconnection will increase. So that is a direct proportional relationship. So if you represent the reactive power dynamics in a, this equivalent circuit manner, the, the grid impedance will act as a resistor. So uh, having a weaker inductive grid will basically damp this oscillations from, from a wind power plant, and which is very interesting. We usually see that wind, uh, the weak grid is uh, mainly responsible for stability issues, but here we are seeing that a uh, weak grid can actually provide damping. And uh, this was also verified experimentally. So uh, so here is the comparison of the uh, wind, uh, wind turbines reactive power output for uh, two different grid conditions that we emulated using a grid simulator. And clearly, uh, uh, for a not so strong grid, we are seeing that uh, uh, definitely we, it is damping the reactive power oscillations. Now, this reactive power oscillations, the weak grid will damp reactive power oscillations from wind plant to grid. But it is not going to get inside the wind plant. So if there is a potential for uh, uh, turbine to turbine uh, reactive power oscillations, the weak grid is not going to have any, any influence on that. So here they are damped by introducing a group control between uh, reactive power and voltage. And uh, by measuring this power domain impedance or basically the transfer function from uh, voltage magnitude to reactive power, we can clearly see that uh, this group is eliminating that resonant mode. And uh, that is what I think uh, uh, happened in the uh, Hansi wind plant, that, uh, that there was a resonant mode inside the wind turbines, which, was, which went unnoticed, but created this uh, reactive power oscillations. Uh, switching gears a little, this is the uh, uh, last topic of my presentation, and it is about the grid forming control of type three wind turbines. So uh, the vector can control part of a grid forming type three wind turbine will stay very similar uh, to grid falling turbine. But instead of supplying current references to this current control through active and reactive power control, uh, as in conventional turbines, for grid forming turbine, we use uh, voltage and frequency control loops to supply these current references. Uh, this is the BSCAD model, basically implementing the same control functionality uh, for a grid forming wind turbine. It has all the control functions like a pitch control, MPPT, the mechanical dynamics, PLLs. And uh, we observe very interesting behavior with, with this grid forming control of type three wind turbine. Uh, before, before talking about those dynamics, uh, here, are, here is one slide which talks about uh, the, the, the voltage source behavior of, of this turbine and is able to follow frequency and, uh, 
and a voltage magnitude very nicely. So basically, uh, the turbine is indeed behaving like a voltage source or a grid forming, grid forming uh, wind turbine. What we observed, which was interesting, is that the turbine behaves very nicely without any stability issue if the short circuit ratio is very less, close to one, like per weak grid. But if the short circuit ratio becomes higher, and uh, when we connect it with the strong grid, it has a stability problem. So this is a little counterintuitive, but this basically shows that uh, uh, that grid forming resources will have a different kind of stability challenges. Uh, uh, they like weaker grids because they are voltage source, so they don't want to connect to a, a strong voltage source like a strong grid. So they need some high impedance uh, from the grid. So uh, as we move more and more towards the grid forming resources, uh, we might see that instead of weak grid problems, we may start talking about a, a strong grid problems. Uh, the, this slide basically shows that uh, uh, grid forming inverters are good at damping interior oscillations without any special controls. What it basically is showing is that uh, uh, when we talk about grid forming resources, we are modeling inverters around the fundamental frequency. So uh, they will have they will help us uh, maintaining fundamental frequency and voltage, uh, and also damp oscillations around the fundamental frequency. But they may have issues. Uh, away from the fundamental frequency and that we need to address. So uh, concluding my presentation, uh, impedance methods are becoming uh, uh, more and more uh, attractive for understanding stability issues and inverter-based resources. As uh, Fred mentioned, we need vendor-supplied high fidelity models uh, till point where we standardize controls of wind turbines and inverters that we can really trust generic models. Till that point, we really need vendor-supplied uh, uh, models. and. Uh, and one counterintuitive into the finding is that weak grids are not always bad from the stability point standpoint. I'm not saying that we have to have a weaker grid because they bring a lot of stability issues, but we can't blame weak grids uh, for all the oscillations that we see in the business resources. So we have to be mindful about that. And uh, uh, grid forming resources are helpful for fundamental voltage and frequency stability, but uh, we need to do in-depth evaluation if. Uh, if they bring in or make worsen existing stability issues at other frequencies, at subsynchronous or, or super synchronous frequency range. Uh, that is that is my last last slide. So this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there's any time left. Uh, thank you, Shahim. Uh, we have uh, probably we'll take one question. There are a couple more in the um, in the Q and A window. Maybe you can answer those uh, when I'll be closing. Uh, would the impedance impacted by would the impedance is impacted by the converter control strategies? Would the impedances be impacted? I guess by the con converter control strategies. Uh, yeah, that, that, so, that, uh, will the impedance mm -hmm. be measured in a real time manner? Yes, imp uh, that is a good, very good question. And impedance is a big function of a control system. So yes, it will be impacted by the control system used in inverter based resources. And uh, it may not be possible to measure impedance of wind turbines or big utility scale inverters in real time. But what we can do is that measure that impedance in laboratory uh, for different operation conditions and identify the worst case scenario where the impedance is, 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 is worse in terms of having a very low damping or introducing uh, resonant modes. Thank you, Shahil. As I said, there are a couple more questions. Maybe you want to address those uh, in the Q&A window. Uh, we are about to wrap up. Uh, I would like to thank all of those strong ones who are still there and uh, listening to the session. And I would very much like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I would like to invite uh, ESIC members to participate in ESIC Reliability Working Group meeting tomorrow, April 29th at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. I would also like to remind you that the last Tucson webinar, uh, the closing pl plenary session titled Nuclear and Renewables, a match made in heaven or hell, uh, chaired by Marco Mali of NREL will be held on Tuesday, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. In addition, our regularly uh, scheduled monthly webinar series will be held on Thursday, April 30th, featuring Rajat Mujandar uh, of uh, Siemens Gamesa on the topic of weak area network control of wind turbine generators, so very relevant to the subject of our session today. Uh, you can find the full schedule of upcoming events uh, on the ECIC web website 
Thanks again for your participation. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next time around. Thank you.